Um, yeah, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna break all the rules and I'm gonna show you a lot of words tonight. You don't have to read the words. Don't worry about reading the words. Uh, but this contraption is largely a contraption of, uh, of words and semantics. So we're gonna, we're gonna go back just a few years. Uh, 2,500 years ago when they were writing down this book called the Bible, uh, there was, so this is called the second temple period in Jewish history and, and I have zero uh, experience in pretty much any religion whatsoever and certainly in pronouncing things uh, in Hebrew, so bear with me. Um, but, yes! yes. <laughs> there was this funny thing that happened when they, when they did that. They, they wrote down all of these things called the Ten Commandments, right? And it was the Decalogue. And something that was in there that was just as important as not killing people was not working on one of the days of the week, right? So that's a, that's a weird thing. But, it, you know, so, you know, what does no work actually mean? Well, so in ancient Hebrew, there was two words for work. And one is avadah. And the other one is, help me. Melaha. Thank you. So the, the normal word for just everyday work is this avadah, but the, the, the melaha uh, work is, is work that was, it was pretty much traced back to the work that you had to do to create the, uh, the temple that was carried around through the exodus uh, as the Jews were wandering around the desert uh, and, and out there on their own. So that so really, what is melacha? So now, if you can't do work on this one day, what can you do? You can't do this thing called melacha. So it comes down to like, you can't carry things, because they were carrying things around the desert. And you also can't do any acts of creation, which also meant you can't make any fire. 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 Yeah, so there's no science in this at all, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> Exactly. So even thousands of years later, when we get the Dead Sea Scrolls, it confirms uh, this idea that, in fact, you can't carry anything in and out of the house on the Sabbath uh, or on the Shabbat. You can, can decide which term you want to use. So then it really comes down to what is your house, right? So you keep, this is the semantic argument that just keeps coming down through the millennia. And so is it the four walls that I live in? Is it the fence that's around my house? What if my neighbor has a house? What if my neighbor has a fence around my house, or his house? What if we connect that fence? Contraption, <laughs> right? So now, so now we, can, we can go to our neighbor's house, and you know, they have some food, we have some food, we can carry things back and forth, and now we're still in the same house, right? So this is how the, the Erev is born. So Erev basically, uh, Irovim means this, this mix of public and private space. And so this, this works for roughly, you know, about 2,000 years until we get to the, the 15th century uh, in, uh, in Krakow, Poland. And in Krakow, Poland, there was a wall around the, basically where they had made all the Jewish people live. Uh, and on, yeah, ghetto. And then on, uh, on, on the Sabbath, they would close the gate and the rabbi would show up and go, the gate is closed we're all inside. And now we can all go anywhere within the Jewish part of a thing. So now, we're, now we're, we're all in my house, right? So five more centuries go on. And, and so what becomes, you know, what is really, you know, a wall? Maybe a wall is just an upright with some sheets on it. Maybe a wall is just an upright with a wire or a little string on it. So now we start having these things where these rabbis are stringing up strings around neighborhoods. And you know, you might imagine that this would happen in a place like Jerusalem. And then you might also imagine it would happen in a place with large Jewish communities, you know, like Flatbush in Brooklyn, or pretty much all of Manhattan, <laughs> or small towns in Virginia, Berkeley, Sunset, <laughs> the rest of San Francisco, just about, right? So if you've ever gone to go get ice cream at Polly Ann's, you have crossed into this magic boundary, right? And so it turns out there are, there are Irovim in cities, more cities than you could possibly imagine, pretty much any city in the world that has a large population of observant Jewish people. 
And the thing that really amazes me about this, and this is how I found out about this, was that, you know, if, if you've ever had to try and get PG&E to come to your house for anything, <laughs> so they contract with PG&E to string fucking wires <laughs> through the electrical grid around your neighborhood. Yeah, right? And then it gets, it's, so we're just at the beginning of this. So, and so then you're, you know, they're, they're up there, they're stringing up these wires, they're all around us, you're going to Pollyann's ice cream, you cross over them. But the other thing is that every single Friday before the Sabbath, they have to be inspected by rabbis. This is the rabbi here in San Francisco, the, the sunset uh, era of, and he walks the whole fucking thing and goes, and then, you know, says, Erev is up, right? But in LA, have you ever tried to drive anyone on a Friday afternoon? They do it in fucking helicopters. <laughs> Not kidding. There are rabbis in helicopters on Friday afternoon following a string around every neighborhood in LA that has an Erev. It's just. Yeah, and so, you know, and not to be outdone, San Francisco has a Twitter feed, of course, for its one. So, you know, I, su I subscribe. I did ask, I did ask on the Twitter feed if I could come with him on one and got no answer. Um, yeah, so the other history of the era of is that it's actually, it's, it's highly politicized. And so there's one in Palo Alto that took an eight-year fight, you know, and everyone gets wound up. It's like, this is this, you know, this is the separation of church and state. No, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to walk across your invisible Jewish thing, <laughs> right? And so it, there's been a lot of fights around era of, um, but generally they kind of uh, do get built. So the other side of the Sabbath that I mentioned is this other thing, right? Like, you can't, you can't create anything. You can't finish any creation. And one of those things is you can't make fire. So one problem with that in the modern world is that, you know, what if you were going to flip a switch? If you flip a switch, a little bit of fire gets created, right? Bonus contraption. <laughs> How do we get through a day without making any fire? Kosher science. Kosher science. <laughs> Exactly. So we have you covered. So this is my favorite part of the whole thing. So it turns out, so y if you don't make the fire that day, that's fine. So if you set a mechanical timer the day before for your thing to come on, like a light, or if you get some Goya to come in and turn on your light, that's also fine. That's all good. So there's the shabalb, which once it has come on, you also have this little mechanical shutter that you can change it, and that's fine. So you can change the light, your light levels. There's, you know, there's this hot plate that can be left on all day, so you can have hot food, reasonable, right? This one is the most amazing one. This is the, the more recent inventions in, in this, is that they, they put an electrical current through the device, and then when you press a button, it doesn't create a spark because it just changes that voltage level. Not from zero to spark, but just a little bit. But of all of them, this one kills me the most. The Shabbat elevator. So you can imagine, so you live in Flatbush in Brooklyn, and you live on the you know, umpteenth floor, and then you walk into your place, and you're like, I don't want to walk all the way up there, right? So somebody turns the little key to the Shabbat, to the Sabbath setting, and then you walk into your, your, your lobby and you stand there like a fucking idiot until the door just opens, and then you walk in, and the door closes, and it goes to every floor in the building, <laughs> opening the door till you can get out. So these are the contraptions that all get invented just because a couple words got written down 2,500 years ago. And I want to raise my glass to the first rabbi who's like, we just need this little string around us. <laughs> Thank you.
Man, if only the Comcast cable lines were inspected to that degree of accuracy. We need some more rabbis to work for Comcast. What's that? We have a thing. You have a thing? Yes. Tell me about the thing. So this was a very special talk because this was Xander's third talk. <laughs> Xander, will you become an Odd Salon Fellow? Yes. Thank you guys very much. We draw blood, but only on the first time. All right, where are we now? Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, with that, our show comes to a close. Oh no, I'm very sad, I'm very sad. Uh, let's give another round of applause for all of our speakers tonight and thank them for their great work. Also, I would like to give a very special thank you to John for masterfully networking our way through this contraption from contraption to contraption. So I give you a, oh. I should have read the directions, Harvey. Um, if I had it lying around my workspace, I would have made a special one for you with like ethernet cable oh. and, and- I have the missing parts for that laptop now. Add to it. <laughs> add to it at home. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And as always, I hope you've learned something. <laughs> All right, next. Join us uh, in, here in two weeks for stories of elixir. <laughs> Tales of alchemical brews. Alchemical? Alchemical. Uh, magical medicines and marvelous mixtures, dubious concoctions and potions passed as perfect remedies. Right here back at Public Works starting at 6.30 p.m. Discount advance tickets available for these salons over at the merch booth over there. Go get a discount ticket. It's much better than dealing with Ticketmaster, I swear. Uh, if you're inspired... Yes, they suck. Um, if you're inspired by tonight's talks and want to join our stage, submit your brilliant ideas to us at www.oddsalon.com speak. Also, I got to put my own promo in here today. You can also watch tonight's show, which will soon be posted on our YouTube channel. So please subscribe. And be sure to join our email list at www.oddsalon.com. There's a box on the screen. Type in your stuff, click submit, and get some spam. You can do that right on our website. Smart spam. It's good spam. We love you. Also, at Odd Salon on all the major social networks, the Twitters, the Instagrams, the Facegram, uh, whatever it is. Whatever you kids use today, the Snapchats, I don't know. Just don't send us any nudes, it's fine. Um, but between, the, between these salons, you'll find us on these usual places. Also, we have membership now, yay! If you like what you see here, please consider joining us as part of our Patreon community or as a sponsor of the salon. Members and Patreons both enjoy a host of insider benefits from ticket discounts to more odd stories to even more odd stories from us, the odd salon speakers and fellows. Go online for more info, inquire over there. Join us on something weird where we'll post the follow-up bits to tonight's talk, including references to all the crazy things that we've talked about. And with that, I'm John Adams, and I thank you for coming to Odd Salon, and we'll see you next week.